Welcome back to consolidation of non wholly owned subsidiaries, looking at various consolidation methods. So we have our INA, that is identifiable net assets method, and we have our FBE, fair value enterprise method. Under our INA, we do not allocate any goodwill to the NCI, meaning our goodwill is going to be less than what it would be under the FBE method, as the FBE method considers all goodwill that occurs um, at acquisition of our subsidiary. Note, to go from the FBE to the INA method, you would do the exact same steps that you would do uh, to go from uh, the acquisition costs to the fair value differential, uh, all the way down to goodwill. The thing is, um, at, once you get to goodwill, you can then remove the portion. So debit or credit, whatever is opposite to if goodwill is positive or negative. And then um, times that portion of NCI, times that goodwill that you determined, and then remove that goodwill portion with the offset being to NCI balance sheet. So I'll show you what I mean um, when we go through an example a little bit later. But first, let's talk about valuing the subsidiary. To get the subsidiary's value, we have three different options. Remember, we must value the subsidiary as at the acquisition date, and then find out the difference between what the subsidiary is valued for and the, um, the amount that we paid, with the difference being the amount that we paid versus the amount that the company is valued for being the NCI. So let me explain. We purchase, for example, a company at $900,000, we purchase 90% of it. Um, perhaps the total value of the company is worth a million. So in order to find out what that whole pie looks like, we have a couple different uh, investigations that we must uh, go through. So the best option would be to use market value of the shares at or around the date of acquisition. That's third party, verifiable, that is our best evidence. Our next best would be to get comparable items. So either valuation models, such as the discounted cash flows, or perhaps we have the opinion of a third party evaluator. Then, the next and last best option is implied value. So we take the amount that we paid for 90% of the company, and then we kind of back out um, to get to the total value of the entire company. So we're really just implying the total value based off of what we paid for the controlling portion. It's the least reliable, least accurate, but hey, it's better than nothing, and it's actually pretty, pretty good, all things considered. Okay, let's look at an example. We have Ketchup Inc. and they bought 60% of the shares of Tomato Inc. on July 1st, 2021 for $20 per share. Tomato has 100,000 shares outstanding. What is the value of Tomato on July 1, assuming A, the shares are publicly traded and we're trading for $15 per share the week before, or B, the shares are not publicly traded and there's no valuation models available. Let's do some calculations. Okay, so under A, we will be using the market value of the shares. So first, we have 60% is what we bought. Uh, NCI, not our company, just kidding. Uh, the non-controlling interest is gonna be 40%. And then together, the 40% and the 60% would be equal to 100% of the entire company. So we have 40% here. Okay. So 60% um, is we purchased 100,000 shares outstanding times by our 60% ownership. And we spent $20 per share. And then we know that 40% of the 100,000 shares are standing. So 100,000 shares, one, one, two, three, times a 0.4. Um, are publicly listed and trading uh, the week before and the week after acquisition at $15. So we now know, I'm just gonna do a little bit of formatting here. We know now that we paid 1.2 million uh, 
out there floating around. Um, it's 600,000. Uh, and so the total value of the company, the pay part, pardon me, the portion that we paid plus the items still trading, the total value of the company is $1.8 million. So why do we pay so much? Oh, goodness. Um, perhaps we needed to just really entice those shareholders, those former shareholders, to sell to us. So we used our economic purchasing power and we bullied them a little bit and we got their shares and now we control this entire company despite only owning 60% of it. So why did we do it? Because there was a business uh, reason in order to do it. So we determined there was value and that's what we paid. Okay, so what happens if the shares are not publicly traded um, and we don't have better information. So then we would go to the implied value method. So we're gonna have to go to implied value. So here we know that we still spent 1.2 million to get 60% of it. So what we do is in order to get 100%, we take what we paid divided by the portion that we purchased and then that gets an implied value of $1.2 million. And the sneaky second check that I do, because I hate, anybody here hate dividing by decimal? I do. So in order to do this, I do it backwards as well. I'm like, cool, we got 100% of the company for $2 million. Let's double check. What would 60% of 2 million be? All right, it's 1.2 million. That's what we paid. I can be okay with this. All right. So let's continue on and now let's look at the acquisition differential and let's continue through to calculate the goodwill at acquisition from the acquisition of 60% of tomato. And let's look at it through the fair value enterprise method. So where we're looking at 100% of the goodwill. And friendly reminder, we're gonna do this um, from when the shares were publicly traded. So that would have been from scenario A. Okay, so we have our value here, and I'm gonna go and look at our ad acquisition. So acquisition of 100% of a tomato, and that would be, in the previous example, when the shares were publicly traded, the 1.8 million. Oh, we'll get some Circular references, sure. So we will trust me. And that's $1.8 million, sure. <laughs> then we need to do is do less the book value of tomato. And our book value of tomato is going to be our assets. Minus our liabilities is a million. We could also take the sum of our common shares and retained earnings. It's really up to you. Okay, so when we get the book value, this would give us our acquisition differential. Which would yield us an acquisition differential of $800,000. Okay, so then to go from the acquisition differential down to goodwill, we need to less at the fair value differentials, and that would be lessing the book value minus the fair value of assets. Okay, and so remember what our trick was. So first of all, we'll do um, the assets. So book value, of 2 million less 2.2 .2 million equals, uh, and this will be for our assets and our liabilities. So our trick was that liabilities are just negative assets. So we go equals negative book value of a million less, um, less negative 700,000. So when we less a negative, it's a plus. So plus 700,000 equals uh, 300,000. Okay, so when we go from our 
it could have been here, it could have been here. When we go from our acquisition differential down to goodwill, we're minusing these numbers. So we're going to have to take the sum of these two, add them together. And then over here, we're gonna minus them. And then we have here, well, actually minus them, so just equal over here. And then we have our goodwill uh, under the fair value enterprise method of 300,000. So goodwill. Okay, so this is fair value enterprise, which means Goodwill is at 100%. Now, what if we wanted to go to the INA method? So at 100%, uh, I'll just put FBE. If we wanted to go to the INA method, that means that we are only counting Goodwill at the portion that is attributable to the owner. So here, we were told that we own 60% of it is what we own. And then we have 40% of it, which is NCI, not our company, not controlling interest. So if we want to go from goodwill, not goodwill, goodwill, um, of 300,000 to um, what the INA portion is, we would need to recognize only our portion of goodwill. So this would be at 60%, that is what our goodwill is worth. So if this was a journal entry and this is already in our consolidated financial statements or somebody said, how do I go from FBE goodwill all the way to INA goodwill? It would be a simple debit and credit. So I wanna reduce, if I'm going from one to the other, reduce that. So how do I reduce positive goodwill, which is an asset? Well, it would be a credit. So I credit goodwill for the difference between the two. And then my debit would be to reduce the NCI on my balance sheet for the same amount. And that would be to, if I wanted to go, to go from FVE to INA Goodwill. All right, a lot of things going on here. Um, but you guys have it all in hand. Um, take it step by step. Um, ask yourself, you know, what's going on here, what is the purpose of this, um, what are the steps to follow, does this make sense? Um, and intuitively, if I walk you through this uh, calculation here, it does make sense in the sense that we are purchasing 100% because we control 100% of this. So we have acquisition at 100% minus 100% of the um, net book value. Then we get the portion that was paid above and beyond. So the value of the company minus the book value. This is our acquisition differential, the difference upon acquisition. Then we figure out, hey, we got fair value of assets, $200,000 above and beyond our assets. Hey, we also got a good deal on liabilities because we are we have a fair value of 700,000, yet it's recorded on their books in a million. So we're winning and we're winning on assets and liabilities. So the reason why we spent more than the book value of the company was $500,000 attributed to a good deal in assets and a good deal in liabilities. And then what's left over is the goodwill, the portion that we believe is in excess of what we can, you know, see as far as the net assets available. That is, the sum of the parts is um, greater than the individual pieces, and that's what we're willing to pay, the premium we're willing to pay. All right, let's go back and finish off this video. So you'll recognize here that I have the acquisition differential, and I pretty much have what I had on the separate Excel slide, except instead of having the total portion here, I've now separated that total into two columns, one for the parent and one for the NCI, not our company, non-controlling interest. And I've simply just applied my percentage ownership to every aspect here. Um, but what I really want to point out here is that under the fair value enterprise method, goodwill is at 300, which represents a total of it. So we're not splitting anything up here. So sometimes people like to display this um, percentage attributed to NCI's goodwill as zero. 
So this means that all the premium paid above and beyond the company's fair value of assets is captured in the consolidated goodwill and sits on the consolidated entity's financial statements as an asset. So if the difference between FBE and INA is that INA only captures the parent's portion of goodwill. So like I said in the previous slide, what we would do is we would have removed that 120,000 attributed to NCI and then only had 300,000 from you only had the remainder. So 180,000 of goodwill here attributable to the parent. Well, 300,000 would still be part of the total. So why may companies prefer INA over FBE? Well, companies that you know, may prefer that would be because under INA, this creates a lower consolidated goodwill number. And therefore, if the subsidiary's value fluctuates in value after acquisition, the consolidated entity would have a lower chance of writing off goodwill. And where does goodwill write off to? Well, it's a debit or an expense to the income statement. So if you have a higher goodwill portion and you don't want a risk of fluctuations, i.e. a write-off to the income statement, then you would prefer the INA method. So companies that prefer the INA method for this reason, uh, to them, the higher assets uh, in the form of goodwill is not worth the risk of the increased expense possibility from the write-off of the goodwill in the future. All right, let's take a look at a question. Holly Inc. bought 90% of Ivy Inc. on December 31st, 2021. Holly paid $1.5 million for their 90% interest. Ivy has 200,000 shares outstanding. Ivy shares traded for $8 in the weeks around the acquisition. What is the difference between the value in NCI using the implied value and the market value of shares? All right, so let's see what the value would be between the two companies of NCI using each one of the methods. So implied method and then using the market value of shares. I'm just going to say market. So we want to look at the company from a 90%. A 10% and then of course the hundred percent okay so if we have 90% that was purchased for 1.5 million dollars that means my implied value is going to be total of 1.666667, which means that the portion that would be attributed to not my company would be this bump up in between. Okay, so now under the market price, uh, I'm flat out said that, hey, 10%, um, okay, so we got 10% and we have 200,000 shares outstanding and times by, $8 per share, well, we're told that, I don't even have to calculate the other things um, because we're flat out told what the not our shares were trading for. Okay, and so the question was, what is the difference between the value of the NCI using the implied and the market value? Well, the difference is simply the difference between these two, which is 667, which is why C is your correct answer. All right, you guys have been doing awesome. We got a couple more videos for you in this series. Uh, the rest of them are rather short, and then I would really encourage you to dig into the tutorial. All right, thank you so much. I'll see you soon.